Hi everyone, welcome to Med Science Academy. This is the first video on our channel, we hope you will enjoy it and that it will help you get a better idea on the topic we will be covering. So today we will be discussing about valvular heart diseases, their causes, their pathophysiological implications and a few examples. Valvular heart disease is classified into either a valvular stenosis, which means a narrowing of a valve, or a valvular regurgitation or insufficiency, which describes a leaking valve or one that doesn't close well enough, or a combination of the two. Here we have a diagram of the normal open and closed states of a valve. Now, if we consider a valvular stenosis, where the valve is narrower than usual, less blood will be getting through that valve, leading to accumulation in the chamber of origin and less blood getting into the receiving chamber. In the case of a valvular regurgitation, where the valve doesn't close properly, blood will be rushed backwards, either because of gravity or because of ventricular contraction, in the chamber it originated in, leading to its dilation. For example, in the case of a mitral regurgitation, when the ventricle contracts, because the mitral valve isn't closed well enough, blood will get pushed in the left atrium. Now, in terms of causes, valvular defects can be acquired as a result of infection, degenerative processes, or underlying heart disease, or congenital. Most of the time, as part of congenital syndromes, like the tetralogy of fallow, which includes a pulmonary valve stenosis. Now, acquired defects are primarily found in the left heart as a result of the higher pressures and higher mechanical strain. Next, what can we use to diagnose a valvular defect? Well, we have plenty of tools for that, which include echocardiogram, chest x-ray, and electrocardiogram. The management of or treatment of this kind of pathologies can be differentiated into interventional or surgical procedures to reconstruct or replace the sick valve, or a medical treatment. This medical treatment option aims to deal with the possible heart failure resulting from the valvular defect weakening the heart, manage the endocarditis prophylaxis because the altered blood flows in the heart are opportunities for bacteria to get attached to the lining of the heart and especially the valves and form vegetations leading to infective endocarditis, and assure thromboembolism prevention if necessary. Now, we will take each type of valvular defect and present a few general characteristics. We begin with valvular stenosis. Generally speaking, a stenosis represents an abnormal narrowing in a blood vessel or other tubular organ or structure. In our case, we will be discussing the stenosis of a cardiac valve. We have a narrow valve which fails to open completely and as a result there is reduced flow through that valve with less blood gaining into the ventricle or vessel. Also, the blood in the chamber of origin has a harder time being ejected in the next compartment and it starts to accumulate. This extra volume of blood will make the respective chamber to develop higher pressures and higher contraction forces to eject it, which translates as an increased pressure load. As a result of these higher than normal pressures, the chamber involved will adapt and develop concentric hypertrophy, or extra muscle, to get the job done. And here we have a representation of the left heart, the hypertrophied left atrium, the mitral valve stenosis, and the left ventricle, which will eject less blood into the systemic circulation. Also, the animation shows us the increased pressures that the left atrium has to produce to try and get all that volume of blood through the narrow valve. Next up, valvular insufficiency or regurgitation. If we were to define it, we should start from the basics. So, an insufficiency describes the inability of an organ or structure to perform its function. Now, considering the cardiac valves were designed to assure an unidirectional flow through the chambers by closing their leaflets, a valvular insufficiency would be the inability of a valve to close properly, right? Alright, we have our valve that can close the way it should, which leads to backward flow of blood, either because of gravity, like it would be the case in an aortic valve regurgitation, or because of the ventricular systole, like in a, in a mitral valve regurgitation. All this blood will start to build up and lead to volume overload as the chamber involved will have to mobilize more blood than normal. Again, the atrium or ventricle will undergo adaptive structural modifications in the form of eccentric hypertrophy. To clarify things a little bit better, we attached here a diagram highlighting the main differences between concentric and eccentric types of hypertrophy. Concentric hypertrophy results from pressure overload and leads to increased wall thickness and reduced ventricular volume. In contrast, eccentric hypertrophy results from volume overload which tends to stretch the myocardial fibers and dilate the respective chamber, making its wall thinner. In spite of this, the hypertrophy that occurs as an adaptive reaction in the fibers will sort of cancel the previous thinning effect which will result in a 
a normal relative wall thickness, as opposed to the concentric type. In the end, the ventricular volume will obviously be larger, but the wall will maintain its relative thickness. Moving on, we have here a visual representation of a mitral regurgitation. On the left, we can observe a normal mitral valve, which closes properly during systole and prevents the blood from flowing backwards into the atrium. On the right, we have a case of mitral insufficiency in which during the ventricular systole, blood is ejected into the aorta but also through the imperfectly closed mitral valve and into the left atrium. As a result, the atrium will suffer from a volume overload, it will eject more blood than normal during the next cardiac cycle and the ventricle will, re will receive a larger amount of blood during its diastole, leading to an increased end diastolic ventricular volume. Next, we will discuss the case of an aortic regurgitation which has slightly different mechanics. Physiologically, blood would be ejected in the aorta and a normal backflow at the end of the systole would be stopped in its tracks by a healthy, perfectly closed aortic valve. However, since we deal with an aortic insufficiency, the backflow would not be stopped and the blood would regurgitate in the left ventricle, increasing end systolic volume. Finally, we wanted to touch upon a few things on each cardiac valve in regards to their possible defects. First, defects of the pulmonary valve are rare outside of congenital conditions, for example tetralogy of fallow like we mentioned previously. Next, defects of the tricuspid valve occur in less than 1% of the population and are rarely isolated. It is more likely to identify a tricuspid stenosis, for example, alongside a mitral stenosis rather than the tricuspid defect alone. For the mitral valve, we can identify a mitral regurgitation, which is the second most common valve defect and is more common in women, or a mitral stenosis, which has a symptom onset at 20 to 30 years. Finally, for the aortic valve, the stenosis is the most common valve defect in industrialized countries and is mostly degenerative in nature, while the regurgitation has an onset at 40 to 60 years. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you so, so much for sticking around to the end. We hope you enjoyed our content. If so, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We also have an Instagram page, Med Science Memes. You should definitely check it out. We have plenty of useful medical posts and funny medical memes. Also, we would like to offer our gratitude to Amboss, an online learning platform that has helped us a lot in putting together this presentation for you. Next, we will upload presentations just like this one on each valve and the defects that may affect them. This has been Med Science Academy. Have an awesome day and see you soon.